Hi, my name is Sophia Chen, and I'm going to talk about WebGL and 3D rendering. So first, what is WebGL? WebGL stands for Web Graphics Library. Simply put, it is a JavaScript API for rendering interactive 2D and 3D graphics within any compatible web browser, as you can see by the icons below. So WebGL is actually derived from OpenGL, which is a computer-centric API used for rendering 2D and 3D vector graphics that is typically used to interact with a GPU or a graphics processing unit to achieve hardware accelerated rendering. WebGL, on the other hand, is intended for mobile devices and it renders on the HTML5 canvas element accessed by using the DOM interface. Um, WebGL, so to use WebGL, part of your code is written in JavaScript and the other part is written in GLSL, which is a low level C like open shading language. The JavaScript portion is where images are loaded, colors are set, and objects are described. The GLSL codes translate the images, colors, and vectors to run on the GPU through shader programs, which programmatically modify an object to produce lighting and shadow in a 3D model. So consequently, it is this combination that lets WebGL render graphics quickly. We also mentioned earlier that WebGL uses the HTML5 canvas element to render 2D and 3D graphics. Alone, the HTML5 canvas element can be used to draw graphics on the web page with JavaScript. It, however, is only a container. So JavaScript must be used to actually draw the graphics. So what can it do? It can draw colorful text with or without animation. Um, canvas objects can also move from bouncing balls to complex animations. It can respond to JS events, such as event listeners, and it can be used in HTML gaming applications. So now, the better question is how does WebGL do its rendering? As a matter of fact, how is 3D rendering achieved anywhere? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I give you math. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> I'll give you this equation. MVP matrix equals projection times view times model where MVP matrix literally stands for model view projection matrix. So okay, simple enough, right? So now let's break this combination down. The model matrix maps from a model's local coordinate space into world space. The view matrix maps from the world space to camera space. And the projection matrix from the camera space to screen space, or in this example, The model matrix has two main components, the model space and the world space. Now, let's take a look at the model to the right. This is the monkey Suzanne. Now, if you look at Suzanne, you'll see the green, blue, and red arrows, which are what we call vertices. Vertices, or the singular vertex, describe a point in 3D graphics, or more specifically, a position of a point in 2D or 3D space with certain attributes. So now in 3D graphics, a vertex has three coordinates, the x, y, and z. These can be further broken down as x as the red, green as the, um, sorry, y as the green, and z as the blue. So in actuality, we need 4D mathematical representation to take us to a 3D screen space. So for 3D graphics, we will now have x, y, z, and w vectors. The main point is that x, y, z, 1 vector is a position in space, and x, y, z, 0 vector is a direction. So that leads us to matrix. <laughs> um, so the matrices, or the singular matrix, is simply an array of numbers with a predefined number of rows and columns, and I'm sure many of you have seen them before. The way we transform our vertex is to multiply it by a 4x4 four four matrix like so. Once you sum up your matrix multiplication, you will get a newly transformed vector. There is also a sample of a transformation matrix where the x, y, and z are the values that you want to add to your position. So here are two examples. The first in the green is by translating the vector 10 units in the x direction. We start at 10, 10, 10, 1, and end up at 20, 10, 10, 1, where the 1 indicates that we transformed a position. The second in blue 
is um, taking that same matrix and multiplying it to a directional vector where w equals 0. We start at 0, 0, negative 1, 0 direction and end up at the same vector. This is good because moving a direction does not make sense. Not moving in a direction, but moving a direction. So we move to scaling matrix, which determine the scale or the size of your vector. And you scale a vector, this time position or direction doesn't matter. You just do straight, straight up multiplication. And finally, we get to rotation matrices, which in and of itself is quite complicated. Um, these are used to rotate a set of points within a coordinate system. Individual points are assigned to new coordinates, while their relative distance do not change. All rotations are defined using the sine and cosine functions. And as you can see, there are three examples of rotation matrix in the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. So here are just further examples to help your understanding of perspective matrix and mapping and those things. So now we'll take all three of our matrices and multiply it to our original vector to get our final transformed vector. So now the order here is very important. You're always going to do translation, by rotation, by scale, and finally by the original vector. The multiplication will actually be done in reverse. So if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Let's say we have a model ship. You scale it by two and you get a bigger ship, and it's still centered at the origin. You can rotate it if you want to, but when you finally translate your ship, it's still the same size, but it's at the correct distance. So now, how do we tie this into what we saw before? Um, so if you think about it, each matrix in the MVP matrix, that is the model view and projection, are separate transformations. So going back, uh, we look at Suzanne again and all that conceptual understanding. Recall that the x-axis is the red, y is the green, and z is the blue. The x, y, z coordinates of these vertices are defined relative to the object, which is Suzanne's center. So therefore, if a vertex is at 0, 0, 0, it's at the center of Suzanne, the object. So now let's say we want to move Suzanne. Um, and so let's get back to a little math again. We apply the multiplication matrix of translation, rotation, and scale to all of our vertices, and everything moves except for one thing, the center of the world. And that makes perfect logical sense. Even if monkey Suzanne moves, the world doesn't move with her. The same goes for all of us. If I move from my place here and walk across the room, the center of the room doesn't change. I simply move relative to the center of the world space. And it is here that we go from model space, where all vertices are defined relative to the center of the model, to world space, where all vertices are defined to the center of the world. Sorry to say, guys, but Suzanne or you or me are not the center of the world. So now we go to the view matrix. The same idea applies to the cameras. So if you want to view a mountain from another angle, you have two choices. You can move the camera or you can move the mountain. While the second choice is mostly impossible in real life, it can happen very easily in computer graphics. Originally, your camera sits at the origin of the world space. In order to move the world, you simply introduce another matrix. So if you want to move your camera three units to the right, then the equivalent is simply moving your whole world three units to the left. So this is how we go from world space to camera space, where now all vertices are defined relative to the camera. And now we go to projection matrix. So we're currently in the camera space. This means that after all these transformations, a vertex that has an x to 0 and y to 0 should be rendered at the center of the screen. But only using x and y coordinates wouldn't work. We need to determine where an object should be put on the screen. Therefore, it's the distance to the camera, and this is where the z-axis comes in, counts. If two vertices at the same x and y coordinates, the vert, uh, have the same x and y coordinates, the vertex with the biggest z-coordinate will be more to the center of the screen than the other. This is called the perspective projection. So again, to recap, we went from camera space to homogeneous clip space where all vertices are defined in a small cube and everything inside that cube is on screen. So let's break it down further. Before projection, we have our blue objects in camera space, and the red shape represents part of the scene that the camera is actually able to see. When we multiply everything by the projection matrix, the blue objects become distorted, and the red shape is now a cube. 
So what does that all mean? The red shape, if you remember, is part of the scene that the camera is able to see. This has changed to a cube shape. The objects within its view has been dis distorted such that all the blue objects near the camera are larger and the others are smaller. You can clearly see this in the image to the right. So luckily, we have wonderful libraries such as 3JS and D3JS or Chrome experiments to name a few. Most developers use these libraries for tough and repetitive tasks, just um, such as the matrix math, which we just talked about, or creating basic geometric shapes. As you can imagine, using these libraries make implementing WebGL much easier. I encourage you all to check out WebGL further. Thank you. Thank you.